It's cocktail oh, hour. Oh, oh, ¿Cómo estamos? ¿Bien? Is there just water in here? Or? For now, Kevin. For now. You can uh, turn the music off. Thank you so much. Um, we're really Thank excited you, to be here, and it's really an honor to be part of this Britain conversation. Um, we, I thought we'd start off talking a little bit about music, our work, but also just the idea of music, um, and then read a little bit each, just to give you a flavor of what, you know, it's hard to talk about poetry, for instance, in the abstract for very long, um, <clears throat> without hearing some, and uh, then take some questions. Yeah, we'd love to hear what you have to say and what you want to ask us about, so. So one, I thought two, we'd- One, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, yeah. Let's start by, I was, you know, uh, thinking about that quote by Walter Pater, where he says that all art, this is the part I hadn't quite right, gotten right, constantly aspires to the condition of music. Do you feel like that is true, A, and B, is that true of your work, or? You know, then I was reading another quote that said, except for music, that doesn't aspire. <laughs> um, but I wondered about that. Um, well, for me, I think it's definitely, it's definitely true. Um, you have to be careful of generalizations, like uh, sure. Twain allegedly said, I hate all generalizations, especially this one. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, of course, I, I tend to believe that uh, writers, poets in particular, have an innate um, envy of musicians because they have a communicative uh, faculty that is not, um, is not held up by language, right? Right, Like right. if you're Czech and you don't understand English and I make a concerto, minor is minor, major is major, piano is piano, and away we go. Or, um, you know, if you're a jazz musician, that's the international language. Right. So even when you take, um, I hope, I hope uh, many of you know the Langston Hughes poem, The Weary Blues, um, but that, that, that poem where Hughes is in a club and he hears a blues man and he, he feels the weary blues and then the blues man leaves, I read that as a poem where Hughes is also showing a little bit of envy of the, the power that this right. person has of just reaching the people while the poet's in the back kind of watching him do his thing. That's interesting. But uh, People sometimes ask me after I give a reading, like, are you a musician? I'm like, why would I be a poet if I was a musician? I'd be much better, like, you know, uh, more popular, perhaps. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, that's, that's... But at the same time, I, I, I think there is that thing where, uh, and this came up for me when the Bob Dylan Nobel mm -hmm. thing um, that he got, um, where everything is poetry. You know, where, where people say, like, someone who's really good at something, they say it's poetry or like poetry. Uh, Toni Morrison, or, or who is, you know, she can wear that, I think. Right. But, you know, anyone who plays anything that we like, we call poetry except for poetry. Um, but what do you think that they're saying when they, they, they clearly don't mean, you know, Bob Dylan writes wonderful sonnets? People think that, though. People think that on the page... Am I wrong? <laughs> Well, I tend to think, I mean, aren't, don't they mean something else? They like, mean literature in a sort of broadest sense, um, which I appreciate because I do think, especially uh, in black literature, oral literature is, is one of our foundational texts that we're referring to, and it's counterpuntal, and you mentioned the weary blues, and, you know, yeah. Langston, we're all in Hughes's shadow, and I don't just mean black poets, because Hughes is someone who first recognized and he does it first in the Weary Blues, but then goes beyond that where he, instead of just referring to a blues singer, he is the singer. Right. And that, that leap from, I'm gonna record what I love, to I am the singer. And it allowed him to speak as washerwomen, as women, as uh, these different figures, porters, uh, you know, and some bad people, too. Yeah. You know, and not be uh, only morally good in some cliched, and he would, I think, say bourgeois way, but allowed him to talk about and as the people. And so I think that immediacy was something that he was going for. So we're all sort of influenced by that. And I don't know what I was, what, what, what was that going toward? Except if you can talk about Hughes for a minute as a great thing, you should. No, no doubt. But you're also, I think, talking about something that's been with literature and culture for centuries, and that's the troubadour tradition. It's something that I've always thought about when I write, um, I feel like a troubadour. I feel you like do. somebody who, yeah, I feel like somebody who's kind of like carrying songs in me and taking them where I go and, and in the process of um, figuring out what stays and what, what goes out. And sometimes you're on the cutting floor and you have to bring your A game. And that's something that, you know, even the troubadours were doing on the continent in the 15th century and the such like that. And 
are they, well, who are they pleasing? Are they pleasing the king? They're pleasing the people? They're pleasing themselves? Or? Well, this is what I like, and this is what I actually think Kevin connects to um, black culture and the myriad of diasporic cultures that there are in the world, that they're playing a double game, right? You please the court on one side, but then at the same time, you know, as your goal as an artist is to make sure that other artists respect your game, you know, and think that you're, you've, uh, you've paid your dues to the craft. Um, and so I think about that, um, I think about that quite a bit, also as somebody who kind of like travels uh, quite a bit, just kind of yeah. what it means to be, a, taking your songs with you. And I think that that's maybe some of what people like about Dylan as a poet, mm -hmm. this idea of kind of like the traveling, the traveling guy, right? The traveling Bob Dylan, yeah. right? Yeah, the traveling Wilbury. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> That's well, I wonder it. about that. I, I, I think that's the other thing I would think is that poems, of course, the lyric mm -hmm. was meant to accompany the lyre, was meant to be sung. And I still think uh, of that quite a bit when I think about what music means to me, how it's influenced me, is that notion of that the poem, even though it's on the page, still has this song-like quality, which is to say it's not a register only of speech. No. It has a register that it let's call it higher, but that is, you know, it might be lower, it might be the lower frequencies that it speaks to us. But that, that music has this quality that we take from in poetry necessarily, but also the thing I'm really jealous about with musicians, um, uh, shall I say, um, is, of course. is we're I among think friends, oh, okay. uh, speak freely. Just you and I. Um, is its wordlessness. Right. And that, you know, Louis Armstrong can tell a story with a few notes and, you know, a, an incredible solo. Uh, and that quality was something that really got me going when I was writing uh, The Grey Album, a book about music in part and about literature. And I was thinking a lot about the ways that wordlessness uh, is something a poem gestures toward. There's silences, there's, right. there's blank space, there's there's moments, and I think, you know, we wouldn't have jazz without that silence, and we certainly wouldn't have hip-hop, which loves, in the middle of a song, to just stop, you know? Uh, and uh, if you're dancing, uh, it's a great moment, you know? Because right. you gotta, it's like a moment of both anticipation and interruption, um, and that's what a kind of line break does to me. Well, I'm definitely. I'm steal that it, from it's, myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's hard to, to communicate that. I mean, you know, we're both yeah. um, working poets and kind of like I can say like, you know, this is a great silent poem, but it's, it's hard. It must sound like a, a contradiction, right? A silent poem and write a quiet poem. And it's a hard thing to describe, but this understanding of uh, not just silence, but the texture of change. You hear it, for instance, in the change from major to minor. It means something, but you feel it, right? Cole Porter, there's no love song finer, but how strange the change from every time we say goodbye, right? Okay, no words. Okay, so it's singing? We're going to sing today? Yeah, man. I come better, on. I, but, I better. But that's a texture. It's a texture that you right. feel, but poetry actually has that too. Mm -hmm. When you read a great sonnet, and how many great sonnets did you produce in De La Soul is Dead, oh, but the whole idea of the volta, the turn, it's not just a... So a sonnet has this thing, a sonnet is you're thinking about something, and then a lot of sonnets, even in the beginning, have this turn or shift. Uh, we technically call it a volta from Italian turn, right? But ideally, with really good poets who have really good chops, it's something you feel, it's a, it's a texture. Right. Um, it's hard to uh, quantify, but it's not hard to identify. You also feel modulation, right? When you hear a song and it's in one key and then it goes up a note to give you that lift up, right? Yeah. Um, that you'll hear in kind of like big um, stage pieces and the such like that. I love these questions for poetry. How do you modulate? How do you get up, right? <laughs> you can't just do it in content. I was feeling down, now I'm feeling happy. <laughs> <laughs> womp womp. Right? But, that, but that's why well, we're we crazy. We have so many tools. I mean, I think that's what I think gets erased if you make the metaphor too close. Right and to uh, allied the differences as you miss those tools right. that are used in poetry, and one is form, of course. Um, I think for me, what was really instructive is I studied with a woman named Denise Levertov, and she used to say to you, if you read a poem, uh, your own poem, and it didn't conform to her ideas of poetry or the line break, she'd say, what are you doing? You know, she'd stop you cold, talk about interrupting. And I appreciated that, not everyone. Did, but I, I appreciate that because she, she would say, the page is a score. 
It is how the reader is the conductor, letting this poem move, you know, letting it, getting air into it. And I think that's so important. And the thing that changed my work was I realized that my score might be different from your score or right. Denise Levertov's score or Shakespeare's score, you know, if one is so lucky. So I, I think that that um, quality was really important to me. I want to hear your poem, though, the one we talked about. Ah. Music? Poem? Sure. Sure. You know, the funny thing about this poem, um, well, I'll just read it and then we'll say, see. Say it. that's the title on everything for us. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of this poem <laughs> is Violins. Um, <clears throat> violins. He never saw a violin, but he saw a lifetime of violence. This is not to presume that if he had simply seen a violin, he would have seen less violence. Or that living among violins, as though they were boulangeries or toppling stacks of other glazed goods like young adult fiction, would have made the violence less crack and more cocaine. Hmm. Less of course and more, why God, oh why? More of one thing doesn't rhyme with one thing. A swill of stars doesn't rhyme with star. A posse of poets doesn't rhyme with poet. We're all in prison. This is the brutal lesson of the 21st century, swilled like a sour stone through the vein of the beast who watches you while you eat. Our eternal host, the chummed fiddler, the better tomorrow, M.M. XVI. Hmm. Great. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I love that poem. Thanks. Is it a poem about music? Is it a music poem? It's a poem about aspiring to be music. Hmm. I mean, I feel like it's a poem to me, uh, and I'm one lonely, lowly reader, um, is that it it thinks about both words, even in that sort of pun of its origins or its yeah. beginnings uh, of the poem, but it also is saying something about like, this is not to say, it's very aware of itself. This is not yeah. in a way that music can be, you know, it can refer to other music very obviously. And it's saying, you know, it's thinking about, well, would culture have saved him, right. this him? Uh, and culture in almost quotation marks. Because yeah. it does think about this question, if not of race, the difference between crack and cocaine, then of our language that we use that gets in the way of understanding each other or of race, or maybe that's the state of things. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so shocked you understand this poem so well. <laughs> um, well, you haven't seen the poem. It's a couplet, um, and it creates also, so the first line, the first two, couplet has violence and violins. And it also yeah, becomes yeah. kind of like a, um, a, sorry, a, um, a tragic, almost, right? Yeah. That one is so close to the other and yet so far away. And then there are a number of, um, you would call them repetitions, I would call them rhymes later in the poem. Thing and thing, uh, rhyme and rhyme end up being repetitions in the way that violence, violins doesn't. Um, I, find, I find a real, uh, tragedy in the approximation of those two words. For me also, you know, I think a lot about uh, verbs as poets. It's our responsibility to think about everything, especially verbs though. Uh, to quote my man Big Daddy Kane, I'm so full of action, my name should be a verb. Um, <laughs> but the verb saw is also important to me in that poem. Yeah. He never saw a violin, not he never played a violin or heard a violin. He never saw right. a violin but he saw a lifetime of violence. So it's also to me about, like you said so, so um, eloquently, uh, even the symbolism of not just music, but types of instruments. I also, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of forming community here. So I'll tell you the personal echo I also hear in this poem, which is not really for you, but for me, Remember, remember uh, Pearl Jam and Jeremy and his yeah. young guy, Man. violin, <laughs> staring at his old reflection. He's like, is he saying violence yeah. or violin? I think in the lyrics it says both. Oh, does it? Yeah. You're one of those guys who like followed the yeah, lyrics sorry. as you listen to the music? <laughs> Man, sorry, Kevin. dude. Man. Um, so there's a little Jeremy, a little Pearl Jam. Well, but just for me. Yeah. You know, we yeah. make things sometimes yeah, yeah. and there's little things just for 
you as that. well. And then you have the you have the opportunity to kind of like jam with um, you know El Migro Fabro and talk about your work and, and these things kind of come out. Um, but you're but also yeah. thinking, I mean, I wouldn't say that the weary blues isn't in this poem or I couldn't make this interesting leap because the weary blues Absolutely. ends with he slept like a rock or a man mm -hmm. who's dead, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is this ominous kind of thing, which I don't know. I, st I probably turn that line over once a week. You know, what, what is Hughes doing with that line? Because he isn't simply saying, oh, he slept real hard, you know, no. uh, which is how I would have badly ended that poem. Uh, and it, instead, he, he, he is getting us to think about the ways that um, you know, death is close at hand. Right. Uh, and I think it's really powerful in your poem as well. I appreciate that. Hughes is also, I think, up to something really, um, unleash the weary blues on the, on the like, panel so you guys can see what we're talking about here. But it's a poem that's in couplets also, just yes, like yeah. um, violins. And there's something, when I talked about his envy, I think that end um, speaks a little bit to Hughes's envy because he's talking about something he can't possibly know. He's in the club and he says the guy went off and slept this way. And it's like, well, how do you know that? It's the poet's attempt to be an omniscient narrator all yeah. of a sudden, right? And kind of gain control back of the poem. Um, uh, but I think bit? that he, I think the whole poem is that tension. I actually oh, yeah, have it definitely. in my bag. Like I keep it like hot sauce. Um, <laughs> uh, so we can hear. Does it that later mean Hillary? Hillary also keeps a copy of the Weary Blues <laughs> uh, in her in her bag. You, you say what you want. Um, <laughs> I, I, I always I think, say what I want. Uh, the blues poems, uh, I edited a book of blues poems and jazz poems, and um, I, w I won't probably read from it, but it's nice to have uh, at times because, oh, and this one, this strange thing happened where I just grabbed a book off the shelf, and this uh, blues poems I edited in like 2003, and this is a copy I sent to my dad, who since died. He died the next year, and it says, a copy of blues poems for dad who taught me to love music. Right on. And so, so music isn't simply music. No. You know, it, it's memory, it's connecting us to our past. How many songs, when you say, it's even something like Pearl Jam, I think back to that summer and, you know, I went to Europe with a good friend of mine, Philippe Wamba, who ends up in this poem you're talking about, De La Soul is Dead, uh, who, who sim subsequently died as well. And, uh, but, you know, I left and everyone was playing Nirvana and then I came back from Europe and everyone's playing Pearl Jam. It was very confusing. Um, <laughs> Same, I went to Europe and that's when kind of like, uh, Portis Head and Jamiroquai and all that yeah. was getting thrown at me and I'm trying to duck. Um, <laughs> but you can't duck yeah, no, fast it's enough. Good. I, I actually love Portis Head, but um, <laughs> Jamiroquai, I don't know. Um, uh, but, yes, you know, yes, the, and yes. These are the things that I think are interesting, that how do we connect each other? And poetry does that through rhyme. It yes. does that through imagery yes. uh, and through the connectedness that is there waiting for you. It's a little like you're the conductor. You get to, uh, by orchestrating the poem and hopefully reading it aloud, because I think poems are meant to be read aloud. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another quality of their musicality, is they're meant to be heard. Uh, reading about music, not as fun as listening to music, uh, and listening to music, not as fun if you don't move, right? Right, right. Um, and I don't, you know, move however you want. But there's also this sense of like, um, one of the things I love about kind of your, your um, poetics, if we could put it that way, is that you're also thinking about how music is produced when you are giving your poems out to the world. Remixes, right? Um, your titles, which then don't necessarily refer to the content, but they're, they become kind of a mise en scene, right? The kind of atmosphere. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, that mechanism, because uh, it's such a great idea. You don't say pastiche or anything no. like that, right? You say, like, there's a remix. Let's get at it. Yeah, um, right. And, and what's, the, what's the mechanism behind, behind that? That's a great question. Uh, there's two sort of things that come to mind. One is that I wrote a book called Jelly Roll, a blues. Um, and I think when I first came here, it had maybe just come out. Um, so it's always great to be back, you know, when, after, shortly after things like that. Um, and that was a book where I was interested in the blues as kind of uh, the tone of the blues. What I say in the blues poems anthology is the form of the blues fights the feeling of the blues. And I really want That's that great. tension between those in the lines of these poems, which were love poems, really. And they were poems of the beloved, whomever that was. Um, 
And sometimes it's the self, sometimes it's someone else, and sometimes it's uh, a god of some kind. Um, but I really want to think about the ways that the blues let us tell the stories about all these other musics that came after. We wouldn't have them. Uh, any of the music we've just mentioned wouldn't exist if it weren't for the blues. So for me, the blues, you know, I could write a poem called Swing that was thinking about emotional swings. Or I could write a poem, uh, you know, I forget all my titles, locomotive songs that thought about the train in the way that uh, James Brown thinks about the train um, and thinks about loss and sings about, you know, the night train, which goes back to me to the Underground Railroad and this long history of escape and travel and distance. And so those poems and those titles, as you mentioned, allow me to access this kind of American, and I thought of it as American, which is to say African-American, Landscape. Yeah, I also, you know, with Night Train in particular too, there's something about music that's beautiful but also risky, which as an artist I think is beautiful, and it's that once you connect to music, it's a little out of your hands because Night Train, I say, oh, there's a poem about Night Train, and you say it kind of like to certain people, they'll go, all right, James Brown, let's get at it. But if you're in like certain other places and you say, well, there's a poem about Night Train, they might go, oh, you mean by country music star Jason Aldean? who has a song called Night Train from 2012, and you love it going. He did? Exactly, right? Uh -huh. So there's a way in which kind of like the associative properties of what you're doing with music. The context. Yeah, they, but they also slip from your hands. Uh, but this is all art does that. Yeah. I mean, you know, all I can think of is my uncle who said uh, famously, he liked okra because it slips, you know? Um, and, and that slipperiness mm. of the... <laughs> foodstuffs or the art, that's part of the pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But you know, we, we, we got a, bit, a little bit too James Brown sort of talking about uh, Night Train and the man and the music, and I was wondering if maybe you'd read your uh, sure. James Brown poem out of your last book, Brown. Yes. So I wrote this book, Brown, and um, uh, I was interested in all these different kinds of brownness. Um, James Brownness was one of them. Um, but also John Brown and, and Linda Brown of Brown v. Board uh, used to play piano in my church. So there was this woman who was a little girl and is a symbolic center of w one of the you know, reasons we're sitting up here today, the, the sort of desegregation of our land or the at least start of that. And so that was really interesting growing up in Kansas and having this history, whether it was John Brown or, or Linda Brown. But this poem, uh, James Brown at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve, uh, the first line and a half is from James Brown. And you'll remember that he died like right after Christmas. And so he was listed to play at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve. And I thought, what if he showed up? James Brown at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve. The one thing that can solve most our problems is dancing. And sweat, cold or not, and burnt ends of ribs or reason, of hair singed and singing. The hot combs caress. Days after he dies, I see James Brown still scheduled to play B.B. King's come New Year's Eve, ringing it in us, falling to the floor like the famous glittering midnight ball drop, countdown, forehead full of sweat. Please, 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 begging on his knees. The night King was killed, shot by the Memphis moan in a town where B.B. King sang, St. James in Boston tells the crowd, cool it, a riot on stage, heartache rehearsed, practiced, don't dare be late or miss a note or you'll find yourself fined 50 bucks, a fortune, even the walls sweat a godfather's confirmation suit, his holler, wide-collared, grits and greens, encore, exhausted, after, collapsed, carried out, away, off, not on a gurney, no bedsheet over his bouffant, conch shining, but boots on, and a cape glittering bright as midnight, or its train. Thanks. Thank you. So that last line, you, 
is enriched if you know that song Night Train, I think. Right. I hope. Um, it, it, but yeah, I love that he was bright as midnight or that thing that midnight owns. You know, there's nothing louder than that train at midnight. I also, I love that moment um, in the poem where there's us falling to the floor. Can you talk about that a little bit? He has a wonderful moment, maybe two fifths down, where you have this embedded yeah. us that seems so important. The sentence starts with an I, and then it feels this desire. It's almost kind of like a, a fulcrum yeah. in the line to, to bring I this I have to us. make sure you're, uh, what I uh, did. Um, yeah, it says, ringing it in, us, falling to the floor. Yeah. Yeah, it seems just kind of like the, the, the poem identifies its, its target, its subject, but then it brings in community. Sure. And it's really beautifully um, Kurt Way, just like that too in Robert Hayden's uh, Those Winter Sundays, Sunday too, my father got up early and put on his clothes in the blue, black, cold, and that us is a whole world of my dad works seven days a week, da da da, da da. Right, right. But it's just two. And that's well, also, so you're saying it's not just my father also, it's also also on Sunday. Yeah, but yeah, it's both. that it's, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. my grandparents could tell a story that wasn't dissimilar. Hmm. Uh, I think that was what's interesting about, uh, I almost say James Baldwin, is that funny? Uh, James Brown, because in that moment when James Brown like collapses, it's a ritual at the end of every performance. Right. He collapses, they drag him off, he falls down. You know, he, part of the, the effort is, is so that I'm so beyond that you have to wrap me in a cape and, and remove me, which seems sort of uh, death-like in a way. He's resurrected. And, and there was something about that, that he's resurrected in us or we're in him. We know he's going to do that. Right. But the power, you know, and I think sometimes people um, mistake improvisation, which James Brown, of course, his songs and his recordings are filled with. But... There's also a rehearsal, you know, and that's what I want to capture is the way, like, if you missed a note in James Brown, like, he would fine you a lot of money, that's right. you know? 50 bucks is a lot of money when you're making 250 or 150 or... Uh, he also got paid in cash before every performance, which... Don't you get paid in yeah. cash before oh, every, everything? I, I got... <laughs> you didn't get the... You know, which a lot of... And I think Aretha Franklin was the same thing. Well, and for, for musicians, rehearsal is a form of... Ritual, yes. but I love the reanimation of the body, yeah. right? That you didn't dwell on the um, decline of the body, of the annihilation of the body. You rather, through the ritual of the man, brought him back to life. The poem feels really visceral and, um, and full of life. But also that tune, uh, Night Train, one of the things I love about it and that you really um, bring to life is that itinerary. Miami, Florida, yeah, yeah. right? And then where is he after that? Atlanta, Georgia, Raleigh, North Carolina. And then you go into Boston, right? Yeah, you're in that's Boston, where he was, you're in yeah. BB, yeah, you're in BB Kings, you're in Boston, you're in Memphis. And the, the poem travels without kind of announcing it's traveling, but it holds in a whole world that I think is really uh, beautiful. Um, and it also reminds me of the hustle, right? So <laughs> Night Train was a Jimmy Forrest song, and the lyrics are different in the in the original version. But Brown adds those places because that's where he's going to be on the road, right? So he's like, I'm going to be playing at these places. Please, DJs, play this song. It's called Night Train, yeah. Night Train, Night Train. It's just like, hello, night. Cleveland, you know? Yes, right, right? If I came up here and said, it's so great to be back in Cleveland. Right. So that type it, of improvisation, though, becomes um, uh, part of the song itself. Just yeah. like that whole um, Back to Aretha uh, you know, what's not an Otis's version of respect is R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. T-C. Take care of. T-C-B, yeah, she just take care of and then she just breaks it down into T-C-B, taking care of business, right? A total improv that's become how we know the song, right? right? And you don't know what the hell it means until you kind of um, rewind and go back to it. But I think you're also talking about speaking within a culture. Oh, yeah. Uh, which we all are, but you know, what makes Aretha's version even more powerful is, I think, the feminist, womanist mm. message that she's carrying, but also the way she's, she's throwing in, you know, uh, black slang, black language, which Otis is all over, but she makes it, she brings it into a different light. And I guess for me, that was one of the things that happened that James Brown poem, is starting with, you know, the dancing quote from him, I started thinking about what we would call soul, you yeah. know, and this idea of soul, which uh, 
I take as, as a kind of sacredness. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, because I'm teaching this week about the lyric, is about sort of the body. And one of the questions for me is how or where does the lyric live? And some of it is in song, but it must live somewhere in the body because the body is where we carry it, the breath, which is what enlivens the lyric. Um, I've just been thinking about it a lot, and you know, I think of James Brown and his invention of, or helping to invent funk music. And when I was writing the Grey album, I was really fascinated by what I ended up calling the holy body. Mm. <laughs> and the way that, you know, funk music's always about the body and like talking about your sweat and, you know, cold sweat, sex machine, these are all body songs. Um, and, you know, the, the lyric at its best embodies rather than describes, you know? And it doesn't just, it makes you move in a different way, right? Yeah. It take, is, does what Dickinson says, it takes your head, head off, off, you know? Yeah. And if you are doing that, then you're doing something right. Yeah, you know, I think part of, the, part of the reason why at the talk this morning I talked about how I uh, write a lot in my head before I start to write things down. And That's it's, so dangerous, It's man. because I'm a dangerous cat. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, you, you, for me, you've got to live with what's in your head as also something that's, like, electric, yeah. that, like, moves you. And I sometimes don't trust the kind of biomechanical bio nature of just kind of, like, this is a line of poetry. That's kind of fight for its life. And I find that when... When huh. it's not written, right? Those, those kind of like steps as you're kind of working things out. Um, but I lose too much that way. Loss is... Is part of it? I, I mean, you're I like so. Biggie Smalls up here. You're like, I, I, I'm just you singing know, about what's not there, yo. <laughs> well... <laughs> you're just keeping it real. Loss, no, is, I, loss is about, you know, I'm a, you're from the middle of the country. I love William Lee Heat Moon's uh, book. Um, Blue Highways? Yes, Blue Highways, right? You're from the middle of the country. I'm from the middle of nowhere in the Atlantic, and, and yet there's, there's something where we, we would be identified as the same, right? Yeah, yeah. So I had a lot of this when I was a kid. We're reading like, you know, go tell it on a mountain or something like that, and they'd say, you know, Rowan, why don't you tell us something about like, you know, the <laughs> NAME church or things like that, and I'd go, you know, <laughs> we are basically Catholic and Anglican and listen to Wesleyan hymns. My yeah. dad was a bassist in the Calypso well, band. Tell, tell folks where you're from then. Who well, I'm from, I'm, well, I'm from the island of Antigua, um, yeah. by way of my folks. Um, but it also, it, it taught me a lot growing up here about uh, how your relationship to music is presumed. Yes. Right? Um, what you like, what you've inherited, sure. and things like that. And I find... Um, I like the surprise, actually, sometimes in telling people, like, well, you know, my dad was in a Calypso band, he was a bassist, but also Handel's Messiah was always playing sure. in our house, E Power's big on the organ and all these types of things. It's basically like you get the whole harmonium thrown at you, the, the, the diaspora. And I've actually had to um, learn certain aspects of black American music, not as, right. an, not as an outsider, but not as an intimate insider. Um, mm. And I, I wonder if, if um, we could talk a little bit about, you know, is this the first generation where you don't have that kind of, I'm excluding myself from this because this is different, but this first generation where we don't have that, you know, almost total pipeline of, of art coming from the church, you know, huh. coming from, from those types of uh, an interesting question. communities. I mean, I feel like I want to say no yeah. Just because um, sometimes, you know, especially with my son, we'll watch like The Voice. <laughs> Not a. This is The Voice. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I, which I contended for like many years, it wasn't saying anything. It was just like high pitched tones. Can I just say for a second, uh, when you said I contended for, I was waiting for you to say I was a contender. <laughs> I was not. It's a singing show for those who don't watch as much TV as I do. Um, a little like Star Search used to be, um, though it's more newfangled, right? Um, but what interests me is so many people still are in the church tradition, the oh, yeah. young black singers. Um, so there's that. But this idea of the pipeline is interesting. I think there's different references. And I contend that you know, my generation of writers, uh, especially African-American writers, we're writing as much about popular culture as uh, sort of folk culture uh, was for the Harlem Renaissance. That's what pop culture was. So you know, the Jeffersons was our Sunday church, you know. Um, it was our, like, thing to think about. Yeah. Um, I, 
I had a dream once about the Jeffersons and church that I tried to write a poem about for years. It didn't work out. But a quick aside about the Jeffersons. So I, I so uh, we used to live in the West Village, and we started having kids. We moved to the Upper East Side. Uh, and I spent about a month getting Jefferson's jokes because we were moving <laughs> to the Upper East Side. And I'm pretty sure that the high rise near us is that <laughs> building that they show. So I'm always kind of tormented by, by so the Jefferson's. I give you this way. poem <laughs> that you can write about this thing. Do you, do you find yourself thinking um, when you study the, I mean, you know, you're the director of the Schaumburg. I, I was born across the street from the Schaumburg. Oh, you're born at Harlem Hospital. Harlem Hospital. Okay, That's there right. you go. Um, and so you have deep props. You don't have to prove anything. That's like rootedness right well, there. Um, only when I say it, I guess. <laughs> um, but the first poem in my first book is, uh, takes place in Harlem Hospital. Right, right. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you study the, you come across the lives of the poets, thanks to you, we've unearthed so much rich stuff that's gonna make um, black American literature even more vibrant in, the, uh, in this century and centuries to come. Um, but you know, sometimes you come across poets or poems you, you, you know, but you realize, oh, they like this music or that music. Are you ever surprised? Like, you know, I know Eliot basically wrote the four quartets to the third movement of uh, Mozart's uh, 15th string quartet, opus 132, a piece that I really love. Um, and I love the fact that there's no, when you talk about poetry as sheet music, there's no sign of it in it. It was clear he just liked it. You know, he yeah. just kind of liked to live with it. But I think about that now. Um, and do you find yourself, or, you know, Larkin with uh, Sidney Bichette and things like that, right. do you find yourself surprised sometimes or thinking about certain poems or artists where you go, hmm? Well, I always listen to music when I write. Though lately I watch TV sometimes, which is people are really shocked. You watch TV? Well, I'm shocked. You watch TV when you write? Yeah, sometimes. Love it. Revising. It's better for revising. Mm. Um, but uh, Particular genres or like anything? I love a judge show. It's very good. <laughs> uh, Does it matter which? Mathis, Judy? <laughs> do you get some old Watner like on TV land or something? Does I it just, matter? I, I, judge Judy is the pinnacle and all others. <laughs> No, you know, I, I think I like procedural uh, dramas can be good. Law and Order is excellent in a revising. Just because it starts and it ends. There's a justice is delivered, or maybe not, but it, it happens. You and Nuri are going to be tight friends. He's <laughs> all about procedurals. And Law and Order, of course, has one of the most famous to be entries. Yeah, yeah. You know, entries. Dum, dum. <laughs> but I, I do want to think about this idea of music, though, as literally inspiration, What if you're listening to it. And mm. I think the thing for me is it's often counterpoint to what I'm writing. So if I'm mm -hmm. writing a thing, something about hip hop, or when I was writing that James Brown poem, I wasn't listening to James Brown. I think sometimes it would be strange. More you're remembering Absolutely. or you're, you're reconnecting. Uh, and sometimes you have to listen you know, some other time and then write later. Um, I think that's similar to the idea of not writing something down immediately. That yes, you kind of, that's right. You, you flee the tautology. Yeah. Right? And I think, you know, you know, people out there might be wanting, how do I get music into my work? Music is all around you. There's that thing that I think John Cage said, you know, proved with his, you know, four minutes, 33 seconds, which is there is no such thing as silence. And that idea, I think, ca captures something else that a poem captures, that there are no sort of small subjects. There are no things that we can say are mute, you know? And, and in fact, a poem does best when it makes mutinous speak, or, you know, it's the wrong metaphor because it sounds... Uh, well, Keats is ditties, ditties of no tone, right? In, um, yeah, yeah. In, um... Uh, someone, someone will know it. Oh. Thank you, Nightingale. Andrew Nightingale, appreciate you, thank you. But the, that whole poem stages that sure. as well, right? Well, what... What uh, else? Should we chat about one more thing and then turn it over? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Oh, more poetry? More poetry. Good. Well, you know what? Whoever said that, I'm glad you brought that up because I've been thinking quite a bit about a section of uh, in Brown. Oh. oh, you picked up the wrong book. Oh, yeah, I'll pick it up. Um, but, you know, your, your section in Brown, De La Soul is Dead. De La Soul is Dead was the second album of the hip hop group De La Soul. I think it was from what, 1990, 89, or something like yeah. that. But what you've done with it is um, remarkable. It's a series of sonnets, but it's not just a series of sonnets. 
Tis a crown of silence. <laughs> Kevin, will you, will you tell They're that? They're interlinked, so the last line becomes the first line of the next sonnet. Right. And every song is not a De La Soul, uh, soul. every title is not a De La Soul track, but you have many different ones. You have Little Wing by, of course, Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. Hendrix, right? Um, when Doves Cry by, and on and on and on. So um, should I, I'll read the Prince ones. Yeah, sure, and please leave, read uh, Little, Little Wing too. Okay, I'll read Little Wing, that's, okay. Uh, so I'll just, let's read uh, two or three. This is called When You Were Mine. Nothing passed us by. Baby, you're much too fast. In 1990, we had us an early 80s party. Nostalgic already, I dug out my best OPs and two polos, fluorescent, worn simultaneously, collar up, pretend preppy. When Blondie came on, rapture, be pure, things really got going, and then the dancing got shut down by some square. What was sleep even for? Housequake. What was sleep even for? The year before, a freshman, I threw a prince party. Reese screwed the lights red and blue. The room all purple, people dancing everywhere. Clicked play on the cassette till we slow sweated to erotic city or do me baby. I'm going down to Alphabet Street. Did anyone sleep alone that night? I feel for you. <laughs> Shut up already, damn. Cabbage patch, reverse running man. Get some life wherever you can. And then I'll do that little wing poem. I don't think I've ever read it aloud. That's why I'm here, Kevin. That's okay. Here. Can I read the one before it? Because it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would die for you. Oh, I like that one. My mother's silent all the way home, not knowing what to say or sing. Me mugged in Paris two days before then, Easter Sunday, a knife pulled on us high schoolers from Kansas on the metro to Notre Dame, always mispronounced. How I prayed the entire ride, saw the madman's pockets blooming blades. Take me with you. After at madrigals, the Psalms barely came. My folks' marriage, even my father's newfound love, a prince couldn't save. Little wing, save us. So late and still, our sophomore roommate has decided to pull out his guitar, plug in and play Little Wing, just the first bars, over and over. Take anything you want from me till we only want him to finish to get for once to the end. <laughs> Years later, he'll kill himself. I still don't know how, much less fathom why. Carry Montserrat, last name a mountain. Play for us again. Mm. I, I love that turn with Montserrat being yeah. an island. Um, it's great. It's uh, uh, there's a Volta in there. Yeah. It turns. Boom. Well, let's hear some questions. If you have any. Music quizzes, some in the back. Can't see up there. I, so. got, a, I got a question um, for, for both of you guys. Oh, no. <laughs> I got a question for you. Where's our cash? <laughs> up front, angry? man. Uh, stacks. Stacks. Out bags, baby. Stacks. Um, we don't even give dollar amounts. We just give, like, we indicate <laughs> thickness of the stack. My question is, are you, uh, are you writing what you want to be writing, or are you writing what you can write or what you're good at writing? And, and this is a question thinking about poetry aspiring to music and, and a, a you know, writerly question about where you're at um, in your careers at this point. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tough question. I'm definitely writing what I want to write. Yeah. Um, but I think you know, a poet's always in process. One of the great things I think about being a poet is you're always a young poet. I'm, recently turned 41, and people are still like, one of the young poets. I'm like, I'll take that. Um, but I trust it's, it's, it's the art of the long game. The long game's the only game 
Um, I was a little crazy when I was a kid on my 26th birthday, I was in grad school at Brown, and I printed out a piece of paper, put it right in front of my desk, and it said, you're 27. No, I turned 27. It said, you're 27, Keats was dead by now, get to work. Um, but poetry, the, the definition I find that I live with now is that it's something that sounds good that you believe in. I can write things that sound good that I don't believe in, but why bother? And I can write things that I believe in, but don't sound good, but then that to me is not poetry. So, you know, I believe in the making, um, and it's always kind of like you're, you're only close to a sufficiency, right? Wallace Stevens of modern poetry, the act of the mind, finding that which will suffice. And poetry is always kind of more of an approximation huh. to what you want to get to, but it can never really be the thing itself. It's Greek poesis for making, but it's not made or have made. Making, it's processing. You've got to live with that, you know? I mean, that was a great answer. Can I just coast on that? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think that, uh, I think poetry changes as you, if you've you know, been in the game, uh, the long game changes for you. Oh, yeah. And um, oh, one yeah. of the things, I'm the poetry editor of the New Yorker, and one of the things that uh, surprised me about the role. I got some poems for you, Kevin. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the uh, thing that I think I hadn't anticipated um, and perhaps the only thing I was surprised me was the sort of memorial role that the New Yorker often plays. Um, we ran my uh, former teacher, Lucy Brock Broido's last poem uh, a week after she died. Uh, you know, I could go on and on of the poets in the past year and a half, two years that I've published who passed away. And uh, that function, I think, is strange. And I feel like as a poet oneself, that memorial function becomes more and more pointed for one. Um, you're sort of thinking about uh, the past in a way, and, and for some poets that's history, some poets that's personal history, um, some poets it's Keats, you know, like walking behind you. Um, but for me it was really sometimes your own poems, you know, you're like, gosh, I wrote all these poems about this thing, can I write that same way or that same kind of freedom, because one of the good things about being a young poet and uh, starting out is you don't know what to do or not to do or what you're good at. And I think that's the sort of part of your question that's the thorniest, is how do you not only do what you're good at, yeah. and how do you reach and stretch? And I think for me, being part of the blues tradition or the jazz tradition helps me with answers to that. Because if you listen to John Coltrane, you don't just sit around and go, well, you know, that was, I'm gonna, you know, go home and write the same thing. You have to be like, well, I gotta keep going higher and higher. I gotta hit high C. I gotta reach and reach um, for that. And, and that desire to uh, change or play the changes uh, is, I think, one of the important aspects of this improvisation that is life, you know? Uh, Ralph Ellison said, life is jazz shaped. Um, and, and that kind of idea, I think, is really interesting. If you think that life is improvisational and requires you know, a steady undertone, but also this flight, uh, then I think that helps you when you're thinking about your own work and what reaching means. Some questions back there. Mr. Phillips, um, on the front of the Baltimore Museum of Art, at the top of one of the exterior walls, there's a Bruce Nauman um, neon installation, mm -hmm. and it's called Violins, Violence, Silence. Oh, really? And I wonder if you have ever seen it or heard of it. I haven't. I mean, I know Nauman's work. Um, but I'm not familiar with uh, that one. I have, I have family in Baltimore who's been giving me a hard time for not seeing them, and I love them. But I'm looking forward to seeing that um, when, I, when I get there. And I, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, because I'm, I'm really interested in um, the way in which the visual also kind of can make music. I've got a uh, pretty bad case of synesthesia, so um, I try to live with it that way. But it's really good to know that, and it's going to be on my... Um, list of things to see. Oh, how interesting. Do you want to gloss synesthesia for people? Oh, uh, synesthesia is when your uh, senses get messed up. So you might hear a word and you kind of like see a color or something like that. You, you can't, every, everything with your, your sensorium is kind of jumbled up. So what should happen, right? Somebody says green and you just hear green. 
but somebody says green and you might all of a sudden kind of like associate it with peach or something like that and it's kind of consistent in that way. But not everybody has it the same way. So there's a poet, Joshua Mahigan, he's a, a wonderful uh, poet. He's also got synesthesia and we kind of compare notes about what comes out That's when so we get certain things. It's, it's fun sometimes, it's not fun other times. Yeah, I bet. Um, when you write poetry, similarly, similarly to music, do you relate it to creating a memory or a oh. feeling, or is it more of remembering something? That's a great question. I love that question. Um, I think for me, uh, a poem can often complete a memory. Um, some, some, uh, Richard Hugo says something like that, you know, especially traumatic kinds of memories or memories that, I don't know, unsettle one, which uh, for me in this book, there were a lot of poems about growing up in Kansas and um, you know the weird racism we encountered. Case in point, we pl I played an all-black baseball team, which was great. Uh, once we started winning, we lost a lot. And then we started winning and we won our division and they wouldn't give us our trophies and they said they left them, the all-white team we played. Um, and that poem in it, I sort of have this grace, like we didn't care. It says, it says literally something like, who cares if they christened their hands with spit when they shook our hands, which they did. Uh, but every time I read it, I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I, I'm trying to make sure that that happens. Uh, but I'm not sure if, if it does. You know, in the poem, I don't care. But it, obviously, you only say, who cares if you care a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> So, you know, for me, there's a kind of quality where you're trying to, it's not redeem, that sounds too big, but like complete, to, to kind of add a, a, a something. And you might think of the poem. Now, it doesn't work the other way around, which is no one would want any of one's loved ones gone, so you get an elegy out of it, you know? Um, but sometimes so Arden, people say that. Arden, Arden described, this is apocrypha, but he supposedly described who does a this? poet as this. Arden described a poet as someone who half wishes that's so Their crazy. lover would die <laughs> so they could write a great elegy. <laughs> That's autumn, man. But I, I think one is, you know, the half wish is perhaps true. I don't know. For me, it's like I wouldn't trade anything. Like, take these crummy poems from my friend Philippe, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think that that quality is really part of this idea of memory that you're asking. And for me, in those De La Soul poems, it was a way to return to a time I didn't even know I hadn't remembered or, you know, and it, it's, there's a line in it where I say, you know, like, how can you stop all this remembering? Once you start on a little project like that, it, it keeps going. And that's the fascinating thing about memories. It starts to extend and extend. Right on. Wow. It's a really great question. I'll just say that personally, there are moments in music that for me as an individual are rich and that I aspire for my work to achieve for me, but it's not, it has to communicate itself through other poetic effects that a reader would take in. I can name some of them. Um, there's a wonderful moment in Heart of the Sunrise by Yes, because I grew up playing a lot of guitar and I was the guy who, I was that guy in the band who would be like, let's do this like 11 minute song with like three parts. And like, can we just do some straight ahead rock and roll? But there's a moment where that song just all of a sudden blows out into this like glorious wash of synths. You don't do that in a poem but I do sometimes aspire to have that type of feeling. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it can't be just like that happened. Or the last three minutes of Stevie Wonder's Joy Inside My Tears off of Songs in the Key of Life, which is as beautiful a type right. of denouement as you can find. Some of the denouements is Chopin, um, but also just some of the wisdom in some of the other types of music that I've heard. They're never things, I get a little bored when poets want to reproduce the, the music that they like, I, I, I'm always kind of bored by that. But or like effect, illustrate a painting. Yeah, you know, right, like. right. But with those effects, it becomes kind of a private, um, it's not a game, because it's really serious, but a, 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 a desire. You have those great moments in music. Well, I, I mean, when I looked at, say, Jean-Michel Basquiat, a painter I wrote a book about um, a long time ago now, uh, 20 years almost, um, I was fa wanted to capture how his painting sounded, if yep. that makes sense. Oh, yeah. You know, I was trying to sort of, it would make no sense to kind of re-illustrate them or, or redraw them. Mm -hmm. And they have words in them, of course, and uh, he wasn't as well known then, and so it was also a kind of risk to do it. Yep. Um, now, I don't know what you would do with that. I've also learned from music, I think, how to just begin 
big. I like, I like songs that kind of get at you. Um, there's so many great examples. Uh, one, thinking of my days of playing guitar, is Cream's Tales of Brave Ulysses that just starts with that, right? Um, but you can learn certain things about your ambition as a writer through the way that music also um, gets But also, that isn't it that music is more immediate to us? Yes, absolutely. And so yeah. when we, like a painting, you ascertain it all at once, and you might get close enough to take time and, you know, it resonates, it changes, like a poem does, but that immediacy, sometimes we feel like we can miss in a poem. It doesn't, its music isn't always apparent, but there's so many poems that I felt that way, and then I hear them aloud and I think, what was I thinking? I was the one who wasn't hearing. Right. The poem was speaking uh, all the time. One or two more? Yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry. So, so th this conversation is making me think about uh, the implosion of time and space. And, and, and okay. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and as writers, aren't I, you an anthropologist? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I've been really outed. To you, huh? really? <laughs> I've been outed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 I'm also thinking about this conversation because I'm writing a piece on my father, who's a rock and roll singer. Okay. And I'm trying to think about the, the process of remembering him and his songs he wrote in the '60s. Who, who is he, man? About, uh, but Bobby Lewis, may tossing and turning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The 1960s. Yeah. Respect. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, so I'm thinking about, so you all talk about being in your 40s, I'm, I'm a little older than you, but, but how do I, how I remember James Brown might not be how you remember James of Brown. Course of course not, course, sure right? So. Or, It'd be or, weird or, if it was the same. Right, or, or, or Aretha. So, so I'm wondering, so, so how do you then as a poet think about that space of time? See, but I, I think you've, you've actually, in your question is the answer, which is to say you have to get your Aretha down. Okay. Like if, 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 if there are so many Coltrane poems because everyone had their Coltrane, not just because Coltrane was great. Um, and, and I think, you know, especially if you're writing about your father, it would be really strange to write the piece I would write about your father. You have to write the one about your own father. Um, for me, my father and music were very much tied, and so when he died, and you know, the two things we shared well were uh, music and food. You know, that's everything right there. You don't need to do much else. So when he died, I wrote odes to him, uh, and through the guise of odes to food, uh, like the food we ate, like greens or or you know, uh, ode to pork was a poem, um, <laughs> but also you know. I wrote a poem uh, while he was still alive called uh, uh, April in Paris, which is about seeing Lionel Hampton play one of his final concerts in Paris. And it just so happened he was literally playing across the street from my hotel we were staying at. My dad had never been out of the country. Um, and so I went on this trip with him and wrote this poem. And then he died, and suddenly the poem, which was clearly elegiac for Hampton, who was in his 90s, and uh, it was about him sort of faltering but being still a ma maestro. Um, was about him, too. And so there's that transformative call. Even when I was uh, writing about Lionel Hampton, I was writing about him. So there has to be that personal double, I don't want to say double talk, because that has bad implications, but double language that is music. And I think you see it, as uh, Aron was saying, in Langston Hughes, when Langston Hughes is, is making that leap about the musician going home that he can't possibly know. That's the leap you have to be willing to take, I think the imaginative connection across time and space. And I think of the poem, the lyric poem, as this amazing mode of transport. Uh, and it does that anyway. You know, you can read a poet uh, like Sappho, who we barely just have fragments of, in another language thousands of years later, and it's fresh as, as you know, the day. And so that kind of transport is what I think you can get into all writing, but you know, not all the time, but when you're doing it well, it has that lyric quality of, it's not talking about something, it is the thing itself. And uh, if you can conjure the music and, uh, and get inside it, I think that's the key. Yeah. I would just also say uh, very quickly, and this is something that I share in workshops sometimes when I, when I teach. Um, supposed to collapse space and time, right? When you think about, so I love slow jams, slow R&B. <laughs> and I will tell my classes, you need to listen to this. It's incredibly pragmatic music. I want something. It's 
It's more than likely you. There's an obstacle. It's more than likely that I fucked up. I gotta solve this in a way that I can get with you. I got about three and a half minutes. And, and this is the best part of the challenge, and I'm not playing a lot of notes. Yeah. Slow jams exist in the elasticity of what you're talking about, Kevin, this kind sure. of like silence and these gaps, right? And this repetitiveness also. You said, well, when I say I don't like something too much, blah, 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 yeah, right? Yeah. But you just kind of like, you don't have a lot of things to say. You just want to please, baby, baby, please, baby, baby, please, baby, baby. And that type of pinwheeling is a collapsing of time and space. Right. And that's where we find each other. That's why we have art, so that, um, you know, my beautiful wife, Nuria, and I, I feel like we're contemporaries, and the only time when I don't, we're five years apart, is when music comes out. Because you have these moments when it's like, oh, I remember when Smells Like Teen Spirit came out, I was a senior in high school, blah, 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 and then she'd be like, oh yeah, I was in eighth grade. <laughs> it's like soul crushing for me. Not because I feel old necessarily, <laughs> but this whole, you know, it's like it's a different, you remember when albums came out, yeah. you remember when CDs when, first were When there were, were albums. Long. Yeah, when CDs were first these long cardboard things, these types of tactile, ta tactile tactile um, relationships with music, the phenomenology of the thing, um, it dates you. And then the things like love and passion and hate uh, and, and inspiration, those types of vague qualities are the things that collapse time and space so that we could come together as people and those five years of difference or 15 years of difference or the 40 years of difference between a parent and a child become collapsed in that. I think that's what's uh, rich about it. You gotta kind of let it happen. It happens a lot in uh, 80 slow jams too. <laughs> and that's the lyric though. So that 80 slow lyric. jams, not 90 slow jams? Not 90 because they're overproduced. They are overproduced. <laughs> they're overproduced. <laughs> See, but I have come to like their overproduction, like the I Maxwell, you. Yeah, yeah. you know, kind of. The, Ooh, the, the, that's not. See him trying to sound as... old but being not old. Yeah. Which yeah. now is old. I mean, there's a kind of great uh, time travel there too. Well, it's funny you mention that because while well, this isn't we're just going to do a seminar called "From Sappho to Slow Jams." Um, <laughs> we had an, we had an intro for you with some James Brown, and the outro is going to be some R and B, and it was almost flowetry. Say flowetry, yes. flowetry. <laughs> but I took that off. The Are we? Table. Uh, should we wrap up? Is that? Yeah, it's six o'clock. Thanks everyone for listening, and enjoy the slow jams. Thanks, folks. You've been great.